Hello and welcome to Euphoria TV Breaking News. My name is Dr. David Bull. I'm a medical journalist and I'm back again as your host for this, our first show of April 2021. This show is all about current challenges of asthma care with biologics. In a minute, I'll be talking to Professor Michael Wexler, Professor of Medicine in the Division of Pulmonary, Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at the National Jewish Health Hospital in Denver in the USA. Now, many people treated for severe asthma still have uncontrolled disease, which is associated with a high risk of hospitalization. People with eosinophilic asthma, or severe persistent allergic asthma, are now being offered a newer type of treatment alongside their usual asthma medicines, and these are known as monoclonal antibodies, or biologics. They can improve symptoms and reduce asthma attacks in people with severe asthma, and they're generally very safe, but rarely they can cause side effects such as minor irritation at the injection site, headaches, tiredness, and cold-like symptoms. Well, it's a fast-moving field of medicine, so joining me to discuss the latest developments in the field of biologics is Professor Michael Wexler. He is Professor of Medicine at the National Jewish Hospital in Denver in Colorado in the United States, and his research focuses on novel asthma therapies, and he's led studies focusing on novel biologic agents for asthma and related diseases including benralizumab, dupilumab, mepolizumab, reslizumab, and tezipelumab. And that might be easy for you to say, Michael. Very good to see you indeed. Thank you for joining me. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. And you did a great job pronouncing those uh, complicated monoclonal antibody <laughs> drug names. Oh, well, that's extremely sweet of you. Thank you very much indeed. So, so let's start. If you can talk us through the use of biologics in asthma care, and, and in particular, um, which patients might benefit from them? Yeah, so the novel biologic therapies that we've begun to use over the last several years are really meant for patients who are poorly controlled despite the use of the standard inhalers, the inhaled corticosteroids and the bronchodilators. What these new biologic therapies have offered us is an opportunity to treat the disease uh, of asthma with more precision and targeting specific pathways in those patients. And this results in improved symptoms, improved lung function, and a reduction in asthma exacerbations. So, so for the patient themselves, for the patient journey, what can asthma patients then expect from using biological treatments, which is different from classic treatments? Yeah, the classic inhalers are helpful in terms of uh, reducing inflammation and helping open up the airways. However, many patients continue to have ongoing inflammation despite use of inhaled steroids and may have continued attacks and exacerbations. So one of the major goals of our therapies, uh, the novel biologic therapies that we now have, is to offer a precision approach to try to identify what type of asthma an individual has and then to try to abrogate the exacerbations, the attacks, the symptoms, to improve lung function for those patients and to offer patients the opportunity to live as if they don't have asthma. We're not quite there yet for all therapies, for all patients, but many of the new therapies that we do have really do offer significant benefits in terms of reduction in symptoms, reduction in asthma attacks, and improvement in lung function. And that's our major goal. We want to avoid patients having to use their rescue medication, you know, once a day, twice a day. We want people to engage in their regular daily activities. And that's the promise that I think that many of these biologic therapies offer. Uh, access to these medicines is always going to be tricky, I think. Here in the United Kingdom, only four are licensed for use on the NHS, our National Health Service. In terms of the global picture, though, what's it looking like in terms of, of different countries and, and how available these drugs are? More and more countries are beginning to utilize biologic agents. They're recognizing that even though these therapies are quite expensive, there can be significant benefits in terms of cost savings if we can eliminate exacerbations, emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and even prevent deaths uh, due because of utilization of these therapies. So while these therapies are expensive, 
if we utilize them in the correct patients, if we identify who is most at risk of her having exacerbations, then we can perhaps achieve some significant cost savings for those kinds of patients. Um, and so I know in the UK, the recommendations are to utilize these drugs in patients who've had four exacerbations uh, or more. Uh, in the US, we actually allow utilization in people who've had two exacerbations or more. But we need to identify who is most at risk for getting into the hospital, who is at most risk of uh, having problems with their asthma, who is most at risk of having symptoms, missing work, missing school uh, due to asthma, and target those patients, identifying what type of asthma they have, and then targeting those patients with these appropriate precision-based therapies that identify the mechanism of disease in those individuals and go after those specific mechanisms. I'm assuming, therefore, the therapeutic response rates are therefore different between different molecules and in different patients, therefore. Yeah, so not everyone responds to these therapies. We have to identify what type of asthma do you have? So do you have an eosinophil mediated interleukin-5 mediated asthma? Do you have a nitric oxide IL-4 IL-13 mediated asthma? Do you have an allergic asthma that's IgE mediated? I'm throwing around all of these terms because we're now recognizing the many different pathways that are involved in asthma in our patients. So our goal is to identify utilizing different biomarkers, whether it's eosinophils, excelled nitric oxide, a propensity towards allergies, neutrophils, what type of asthma does a patient have? And then we can go after our patients with these targeted therapies to offer them the opportunity to have significant benefits and improvements in their overall asthma control. Well, you talk there about using biomarkers and, and so forth. Can you therefore predict the therapeutic response once you've done all of those? Uh, are you often right? So most of these therapies work quite well in the patients for whom they are uh, targeting. Um, so people with eosinophilic asthma generally, generally respond to an interleukin-5 therapy like mepolizumab or benralizumab or reslizumab or an, an antioph 13 therapy like dupilumab. And so, uh, but not everyone responds. And so to some extent, it's a little bit of a trial and error. And we also need to recognize that there are other mechanisms at play in those patients, that there are other factors that result in people continuing to have asthma. And you can have more than one component of disease, more than one mechanism that's at play. And that's a really important thing to recognize, that asthma is very dynamic. You may go to your aunt's house who, and your aunt has a cat, and that can trigger an allergic, uh, an allergic component of one's asthma. And then your child may, co may come home from daycare and bring home a virus, and that may trigger a different component. And these targeted biologic therapies work well in some settings, but not necessarily in all settings. So some of the goals that we're trying to achieve now are trying to think about, can we work more upstream to target more pathways? Uh, can we uh, target different pathways in those patients? Are there ways that we can give patients the, the right drug at the right time for their specific asthma? You said they're not cheap drugs. How do you actually get the authorities to understand that, that clever use of these in the right patients is actually cost effective? Yeah, so pharmacoeconomic studies uh, have been done and need to continue to be done to demonstrate that there are benefits. Every time a person goes to the hospital, that, that costs a lot of money. So we need to identify the right patients who are at highest risk of hospitalizations and exacerbations and emergency room visits. Uh, yes, these therapies are expensive, but every time a person stays home from work because of their asthma, or they stay home because their child can't go to school and they have to take care of their child, that costs the overall economy uh, dollars as, or, or, or pounds as well. And so we need to recognize that, uh, that significant cost, cost benefits can be had by treating patients, preventing exacerbations, not to mention there are benefits to the individual in terms of uh, uh, preventing long-term use of, of uh, corticosteroids, which are associated with significant side effects. So for instance, uh, when people are on chronic oral corticosteroids, they're at higher risk of glaucoma, cataracts, osteoporosis. 
And so if we can prevent utilization of corticosteroids, then we could prevent those other comorbidities that also cost a lot of money to manage. So there are a lot of considerations, both in terms of the asthma, as well as the side effects of therapies. And we may also be able to get some savings in terms of reduced prescription of some of the other inhalers that patients are on. So there are many ways that prescribing these targeted biologic therapies can result in cost savings. But we need to use these therapies judiciously. We need to use them in the appropriate patients to identify, again, which patients are most likely to benefit from which drug therapies. Well, I can't thank you enough. Thank you very much indeed, Professor. Thank you so much for having me today. And thank you for bringing us a platform to discuss the important advances in asthma management. Thank you very much indeed, Professor. Well, that's it for this edition of Euphoria TV Breaking News. Many thanks to my guest, to Professor Michael Wexler, for his really insightful interview. And you can find more information about Euphoria and register for the Euphoria meetings on the euphoria.eu website, where you can also sign up to receive the latest news via email. You can also follow us on Twitter. The address is at Euphoria. But that's it for this show. See you soon. And thank you for watching.